morning. So uh, thanks, Jonathan, Charlie, and Joel for having me back. Thanks for moving it to the east, a little bit closer to the east coast. Uh, I apologize for my videos. My capabilities are limited to an iPhone and my daughter's ability to edit them. So I apologize in advance. So these are my disclosures. Uh, you know, I keep in mind that I helped develop a product in this space along with Charlie, JV, and Andrew Cooper. So keep that in mind. You know, contrary to what the guys from Belgium, what attracted me to the anterior approach was to use fluoroscopy in surgery and not have a surprise in the recovery room. So that's what I learned post-year, and that's one of the main reasons why I moved to the anterior approach. And, you know, we demonstrated early on that you can get pretty accurate with this. We, we kind of peaked at about 92%, both combined aniversion and inclination without just, with just plain fluoroscopy. Uh, uh, regardless of the BMI, so you can get pretty accurate even with high BMI patients. And now there's been an explosion of technology. I mean, now you're not just using fluoroscopy. You can use fluoroscopy on steroids. You can add value to that with different technologies that are, are out there in the market. And, you know, and the question still remains, should, can we and should we alter the cup position in patients with a stiff spine? Uh, there's a lot of debate on that. We know that these patients are at increased risk of instability. And I bet you that if I ask the audience if anybody has a dislocation problem, you all will say no, but the AJR data shows that 20% of revisions in this country are done for instability. And early revisions is the number two cause of, of revisions, about 27%, so it's not insignificant. JV published a couple of papers on this, and about 50% of the cups on revisions uh, were malpositions in his series. And if and when he specifically looked at unstable hips, what he found was that if you didn't use a, some sort of spine hip protocol, about 70% of the cubs you would think they're in the right position when in fact they're not. So, you know, I helped develop Cuptomize with uh, Charlie and another group of guys. And, you know, it's a very simple technology that will help you determine where the cup is in the pelvis tilt that is in surgery at the time and can extrapolate that to a sitting and a standing position. And then you can make the decision that you want after that. You can alter the cup position if you want. If you want to change the bearing surface you want, you can do that as well. And I'm going to show you some videos of this. So you have to get four x-rays. You, you get two AP x-rays, one standing and one supine. And then you get two lateral x-rays, one standing and one sitting. Whether you get it forward flex or relax seated, it's up to debate. You know, I think the forward flex seated x-ray shows you at a more of a high risk position of the patient, but that that's still to be determined. So this is a video of, of, the, of how you do this. You basically import the, uh, you first do the lateral standing x-ray and you draw the line over the S1 end plate. The system will calculate the sacral slope. Then you do the same with the lateral sitting x-ray. In this case, the forward flex seated x-ray, you draw the S1 end plate. It automatically calculates the sacral slope at that point. And then you're going to import the AP. You'll do the supine x-ray, and you're going to draw what's called the SFP angle, sacral femoral pubic angle, by drawing this S, the bottom of the SI joints to the femoral head to the pubic bone, and it calculates that SFP angle. And then you're going to do it again on the standing AP pelvis. This preoperative plan literally took me a minute. You, if you calculate it, it's exactly a minute. And then the system will give you kind of a, an overview of what you're looking, about, uh, looking at in terms of pelvic tilt. So in this case, if you put the cup at 4020 in the supine pelvic tilt, that will translate to 4225 standing and 3713 sitting. This is a patient that when they, roll, when they forward flex, the pelvis rolls forward significantly and, and is dropping the, a significant amount of aniversion. Now the question is, what are the limits that you're looking for? So we know based on literature that you don't want more than 30 degrees of aniversion standing. What's the minimum that you want sitting? That's still debatable, but we think about 20, you want a little bit more than 20. So in this case, you don't have a lot of leeway. If you go past 30, if you start to try to get more aniversion to compensate for posterior instability, then you're going to start running into more than 30 standing, and then that might lead to anterior instability. Now, so how does this work when you're in the operating room? So because you're calculating the SFP angle, the, the system knows 
where your pelvic tilt is there. So now you don't have to be adjusting the C arm to target a specific pelvic tilt like uh, the previous speaker was talking about. So it already knows it by the SFP angle. So then when you're in surgery, I get an AP pelvis, and while I'm operating, the rep is drawing these angles. You're not doing this. The rep is doing it. He's drawing some landmarks that he's going to use to recreate, to overlap the images later on. And you'll see this. And the other, the other angle that he's going to draw is that SFP angle that I talked about. And it's going to remind you where you picked your land points preoperatively. You'll see this. It's reminding the rep where those uh, points were taken preoperatively so he can be consistent. So now he's going to draw the SFP angle here. And by doing that, again, the system knows automatically where the pelvic tilt is there and can extrapolate to where it's going to be sitting and where it's going to be standing. By the way, I learned how to screen record during this talk, so that was phenomenal. Uh, so now, after this, this is intraoperatively. You put your cup in, and now you're gonna, the rep is going to draw these, the brim line again so they can overlap the images. And it's going to spit you the number of the acetabular cup alignment in this case. So now it's telling you, once the rep draws these, uh, the ellipse, it's going to tell you, well, you're 4017 here. That goes to 4423. And so in this case, I adjusted the anniversion a little bit. I went to 25 of anniversion in the standing position, which is kind of the limit that I think is appropriate. This is a patient that I didn't really release any of the posterior structures, so I felt pretty comfortable in terms of stability. Uh, but you can argue that you, with this information, you may want to switch to a dual mobility or try to get a bigger cup to get a bigger head. It's up to you in that case. You know, and the question of whether the anterior approach mitigates the risk on these patients, it's a legit argument. There's been some good papers recently that have shown that the that the anterior approach dislocation rate, even in this high-risk patients, is lower in this patient, in this case, in this series of the guys in Utah, anterior approach dislocation rate 1% versus 3.8%. In, in this other series in 2022, 111 patients with instrumented lumbar fusion, anterior approach dislocation rate 0%, posterior approach 5.4%. And in this more recent paper, they look at 367 patients with spinal stiffness. Again, the this location rate on the anterior approach was significantly lower than in the posterior approach. And that's even considering that the posterior approach patients had a higher usage of dual mobility and bigger heads. So in conclusion, I think fluoroscopy definitely helps improve the accuracy of component position. That's what drew me to the anterior approach, and I still use it. I think enabling technology can provide objective information that helps you in the decision making. And, you know, there's an argument to be made that the anterior approach may mitigate those altered spinal pelvic dynamics, and it may not be an issue if you do the anterior approach. So thank you very much for your attention. I have a question for Dr. Suarez. Have you ever been in a situation where using that cup demise or pre-app planning, you get certain numbers, and then when you're in the OR and you, get, you put the cup exactly where you want, and, but it doesn't match up quite anatomically with being tucked under the anterior wall or something like that? And if you're in a conflict like that, which would you go to and would you tolerate leaving some uncovered in the front to hit those numbers and risk something like psoas irritation or something like that? That's a great point. So I think that there are situations where, you know, these patients that have a very, uh, are very posteriorly tilted on a standing view and you're seeing those obturators, huge obturators, you want to dial down the anaversion a little bit, you may run into that. I think that you can use smaller cups in, in, um, in the, the anterior approach, smaller cups, and that can help mitigate that, maybe tuck that cup in a little bit deeper. But you got to get away from trying to be, put a bigger cup because you can run into that situation. But definitely there's boundaries that we still have to respect. And then, you know, you may want to change your bearing surface in those situations if, if you can't, you know, get the, the target that you're trying to achieve. It was great talk. And I think, you know, I, we're learning more about the hip-spine relationship. But I think one of the things is a lot of times people assume they know what the standing pelvic position is. But I would argue if somebody's got severe flexion contractures, after you've dealt with their flexion contractures, their standing pelvic position has changed. They're not as tilted anteriorly as they were. So, so you have to, I mean, you can't assume that it's going to be exactly the same after we've dealt with their hip deformities. 
it's typically on patients with bilateral disease. Those are the patients that you really got to be careful about, and you got to examine them. And, and I agree, they, you know, I think JV has some data on that, and they kind of correct about seven degrees. You can calculate that. So he's doing a lot of work on that as well. Yeah, I was just going to make one comment. Uh, to, we heard comments about you, you had the dislocation case, uh, Dr. McGlaston, and the posterior instability case, and we're hearing a lot about aniversion. But one thing you have to inter remember, too, is the inclination part. So as you, your case is dislocated at a very low inclination, so as you decrease inclination below 40 degrees or below 45 degrees, the potential for posterior instability increases. So low inclination cups are prone to posterior dislocation. Very high in inclination cups are prone to anterior uh, dislocation. So it's not just aniversion, it's also the inclination. And it's kind of counterintuitive for some people, but low inclination cups will produce a posterior instability because they uncover posterior inferior and then the neck will impinge in flexion. But it's a complex subject. <laughs> All right. Go ahead and move forward to our last speaker, uh, Dr. Mastani.